The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Everyone ran their socks off tonight and they left everything out there. We're very proud of the, the team's performance. Let the shackles off Katie a bit so that she can go and play her game. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello there and welcome to episode 36 of the Koi Gig podcast on OTB Sports. I'm Kathy McNamee and I am back with my partner in crime, Karen Duggan, as we look forward to one of the most pivotal weeks in Irish football as our girls in green look to reach their first major tournament. How are the nerves, Karen? I won't lie. I did wake up this morning with like this weird pit in my stomach. And every time someone asks me about it, I just get nervous and I'm like, I don't know what to say. I don't- I'm the same, yeah, because it's getting a lot of build up and a lot of attention and I'm kind of like, oh, just don't build it up too much. We've done this before and the the ghosts of Ukraine are still haunting us. So I'm looking forward to it being over. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the exact same way, even whenever I'm asked to do work things around it. I'm like, no, I just want to sit there with my hands behind, <laughs> like in front of my eyes, not looking at it, kind of crouched in a corner, screaming to myself every so often. I think it's because we have so much hope and so much expectation that we can get the job done against Finland. I know we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but Finland are beatable. Finland are a beatable team. We've seen that in this campaign. We saw they're showing in the Euros, very poor, a lot of unrest there. Um, But also they don't need the win. So it's how they approach the match will be interesting, whether they sit back and take a draw possibly and then go, you don't really want it going down for the Slovakia game. Um, But it's not the end of the world if they don't win. But the way it's being built up, it's it's far the win really I think everyone's expecting that which is I know nervy well we will get into it a bit more and look at both squads but just to give everyone a bit of a rundown of what's happening on the show today uh we'll obviously be previewing the massive game dare I say it (laughs) as well as looking ahead to the 2022-2023 women's super league season which starts on September 10th Emma Carroll will be joining us later in the show to rank which clubs have had the best and worst transfer windows plenty to pick apart there some transfers I didn't even remember happening at the start of the summer window I was like oh yeah thank came to the WSL that's gonna be fun uh then we will be hearing from recently retired Ireland goalkeeper Marie Horan as she embarks on a new coaching journey the Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports is an association with Cabri FC official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team Karen I'm probably as bad as anyone at the moment for hyping this match not even to anyone else just in myself but I suppose one of the most interesting things about this is that we do have that expectation. We do have that quality. I covered quite a lot of Finland's games during the Euros. They've had a very difficult lead up into this. Obviously they didn't win a single game. They conceded eight goals. They scored one goal in the first match in the first minute. And that was it. Afterwards, they didn't score again. They've lost their coach. They have an interim coach who's their under 17. They've had quite a lot of changes in their coaching staff anyways, even pre the Euros. Today, it was announced that their midfield has been decimated with mm. uh, Alan and Engman both not traveling. How do you think Ireland are thinking about this match with all of that? Are they thinking these guys have something to prove and we need to make sure that we are ready for that? Or... Is this a squad that has gone through the wars and maybe isn't up to the sort of level that we would expect them to? I, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It, they they've gone through a lot of turmoil, like you said before their coach left. There seemed to be kind of a lot of people leaving under her guardianship. She wasn't possibly the most liked by staff there. Um, like say now they're in a bit of upheaval so it's whether there'll be a hangover from that or whether there'll be a bounce effect I was nervous about the bounce effect but seeing the two players that they've lost today that you mentioned they're two big players and it's just another thing to throw Finland off I think Ireland will obviously be wary but everything is stacking up in Ireland's favour um, and we have to have that belief that with those players out and given the result that we had in the away game um, that it is very possible that we can get the win here. I think that Finland were a bit shell-shocked by Ireland in that away game. I don't think they expected us to press as highly and as aggressively as we did. So they will be a little bit more prepared for us this time. 
but I think Ireland have, are very resolute um, and I don't see us being torn apart by Finland um, and I'd be surprised if we got at in less than a draw out of the game. Mm. Being very hopeful here, but um, I just don't think the Finland that we've watched over the last year, I mean, apart from the Georgia games, I don't, I don't think they've had a win in a year. Um, mm. So they're not a team that's coming in high on confidence off the back of a good Euros or off the back of anything, really. It's... Um, it's it's it I'd say it's a, a strange place to be in that Finland camp at the moment definitely and I think from watching them at the Euros I probably would have said that like Corpello was one of their best players and she's their goalkeeper which is great if you want and like they do tend to play quite defensively minded and I know like their fullbacks love getting up the pitch which leaves them open if we do counter attack and if we can benefit off that that's great if we can stop their set pieces which is also something that they rely on very heavily I mean there's so many of their players where the majority of their goals don't actually come from play they come from dead balls Mm -hmm. so I'm sure that's something that the Ireland squad have been looking at but what I found whenever I was watching them there was just they kind of would get the ball up to the final third and apart from Salstrom occasionally there was very few players who seemed willing to actually even take it on and take on the shot So I think if we can keep doing what we have been doing, which is making sure we don't make those stupid mistakes that we have in the past and those ones where you're looking from behind the couch being like, I can't believe that just happened. We should get a result out of this game. And especially with the way their midfield has been decimated with those two injuries. You know, you look at the players we have, the fact that like Katie McCabe keep running through that. Denise O'Sullivan should be able to boss it completely we should be in a good spot. Yeah, I mean, if we play like we did against Sweden in that away game, we will come away with the results. Um, Getting up to those performance levels um, is key for this game. We will have to play well. They're still ranked ahead of us. They still have some very good quality players. But like you say... the Euros when we didn't. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We can't deny the rankings. Like, it's there. It's set in stone for us. It's black and white. But at the same time we're we've cut out kind of silly mistakes and we will set up I think you hit the nail on the head there I think we will set up for that counter I think we'll still play the well we should call it a three at the back but it's a five at the back and it will encourage Katie then to kind of push on on the break I think that Heather Payne will probably start up front and have to run 14 kilometers again or whatever she does but she's a great outlet um and I think that they will struggle with her pace it's just and now that we have probably a stronger midfield than they do, if we grasp that and set Heather away and release Katie from that fullback position and possibly even go with Jess Zoo on the right, I mean, that's a pretty attacking fullback. Mm. I don't like us playing five at the back, but when you have attack minded people like the two of them in those positions, um, it does kind of breed confidence into, into the, us in an attacking sense. So I think that that would be a good statement of intent if we do go with attacking fullbacks as opposed to more defensive players who might sit back and then we'll draw pressure on ourselves and Mm. like we're very good defensively but if you give a team like Finland chances after chance and you'll end up conceding set pieces and things like that they can they can hurt you but um yeah I think getting a grasp that midfield is going to be very doable now um and I think that well I'm hoping to see another Denise O'Sullivan masterclass and a few assists for Katie I think that's been the the key kind of partnership for us Mm. in terms of our goal scoring so um yeah very very hopeful yeah it's interesting you mentioned Jess Sue there because she was speaking at the training open training session today and she was very open about the fact that she is gunning for that starting place and that's where she wants to be and I suppose it's to be expected considering her move to the women's super league she's already been over there training with the team so has already taken that step do you think there is a likelihood of her getting the start on Thursday yeah I don't see why not I think that she's proven in the games that she's played that she can more than cut it at this level um I think she's an exciting player and she's someone who kind of plays with confidence and that's great to see you know and I think the move to West Ham is only going to build on that she is we interviewed her before she studies the game like no one else so I don't think she'd be overawed by it and if you have the talent why not play someone like her and again it would mean that we don't have to pull someone like Heather back into that position um what will be interesting actually is now that Megan Campbell is back 
Mm. Um, that, that was one of the places I was going to ask you about what yeah, you're thinking. I mean, I feel like I'm copying and pasting everything I say every week, but can we release Katie forward a bit more then and possibly Megan can go in that full back position or will she look be looking at one of those three centre back spots, a competition possibly with Diane, who we know was in uh, competition with Savannah McCarthy before. Um, mm. But I think Diane has shown for Man United and now she's got her move to Reading that she's still very much uh, an asset to this team. Mm. So it's, there it's are, big call, yeah. Yeah, I, and the other one I was going to ask you about is in goal because obviously Vera Pau said before that, you know, Walsh was probably in there but it just didn't happen at the time and like put a lot on Brosnan, obviously gave it a massive performance and has given really good performances and now looks like she's got the number one jersey at Everton. I mean, at the weekend she started against yeah. United, only conceded one goal, did get yellow carded very early on in the match for being a bit too eager coming out of her goal and taking out, I think it was Leah Galton, but... Uh... I don't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> So long as it only has, if it's one yellow card in the entire yeah. match, that's absolutely fine. I have yeah. no issues with that. I'm not giving away a penalty. I, I yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I didn't really love those comments when she said that Megan was going to be in it. It didn't really feel like they were necessary, even if it was true that Megan was going to start. Um, Because I think that over the course of this campaign, um, Courtney Brosnan has, has proven herself to be an excellent goalkeeper and very resilient given the criticism that she came in for in the previous campaign. I mean, goalkeeper is the worst position on the pitch. Like there's, there's no hiding place. And for it to it be- has constant, come on a lot. Like yeah. you can't deny it. We've said no, it. She has, she oh, absolutely right. has. Um, I do really rate Megan Walsh. I think she's excellent. Um, but in terms of just consistency, I think that it should be Brosnan that will start. Um, she's comfortable with her back line now. It's not a, a position you really want to be talking about going into a big game like this so I would be surprised if there was a change there yeah I just after what Vera said before I was slightly doubtful and again I'm much like you I didn't know how necessary the comments were and I don't know was it as much to keep a fire lit under both players and say like look things are still open Mm -hmm. you show me you can do something and that position might still be there for you it could have been that but in the context of the night, it just seemed like a strange thing to say that yeah. early on. Yeah, well, that's kind of what you get from Vera, though. Sometimes she just she's very direct and whatever pops that into is. her head, she says it. So um, it, it keeps us entertained anyway, because those <laughs> things to talk about. Um, but for a goalkeeper who I think deserves praise for how she's handled herself over the campaign, uh, it, it was could have been been left out but I think possibly it's to praise Megan and and show how good she is as well and that there is competition for those certs and like it's mad that someone like Grace Maloney is she's essentially third choice now and we know her quality and what she's been doing the WSL for a number of years now so it's it's a good headache to have but also the most important position to be consistent so Mm -hmm. Um, if it's going to be Megan in the future it needs to start now I guess but I don't think based on performances you, it would be right to drop Courtney I mean she was player of the match again against Sweden she's had a few of those performances and um, has basically kept us kept us in this campaign at times yeah. so, um, and has very much risen to that as well like you can definitely see a progression game actually I, I don't even know if this is fair that you can see a progression game to game I think maybe I just get more confident game yeah. to game because the first few ones I watched, I did. I still had that horror. And like when I was sitting watching the Euros, it was just coming back to me constantly. And I was like, uh. and I, I mean, I'm sure they feel the same way. But like, yeah. it's probably as a supporter and a viewer, I got more and more confident in seeing that she clearly put in quite a lot of work to take that out of her game and touch wood, pray to whatever gods you pray to or what whatever you believe in that it doesn't happen this week because I don't think I could take that again <laughs> oh, no definitely not that would be the last thing we would want to see <laughs> just just that focus on one player you know as well for yeah. whatever the outcome of the game it, it should be win as a team lose as a team but when something like that does happen it's hard not to hone in on it and um but like I say she started for Everton at the weekend hopefully a sign of things to come because that was possibly the thing that was 
tipping Megan as well was that consistency mm. in game time and Megan was showing week in week out that she was making fantastic saves and um was really making a name for herself and it was hard for Courtney to do that given that she wasn't yeah. getting game time she's obviously putting the work in on the training pitch but it's not the same you know and it's it's not what your international manager is seeing she's just seeing your games you know yeah it is interesting that that went in Megan's favor when it didn't go in Grace Maloney's favor when because mm. she was starting a lot more steadily than Brosnan was she probably would have been in people's eyes the natural next step which is m- makes me think that maybe it's to do with training in camp because mm. um that's the only logical explanation it's um Jan Villian is obviously seeing something in camp that shows that Courtney is is a step ahead or um we we don't quite have the inside scoop on that but that's the only thing you could say um Mm. in that regard yeah and another thing that I was looking at today maybe what I was getting a little bit ahead of myself because (laughs) I keep thinking that if we win these matches or you know if we get the points we need we're in the world cup but we're not actually we're in playoff and I feel every time an international window rolls around I remind myself of what the playoffs consist of and I forget how complicated they actually are like this is in some ways the easy part of our qualification unfortunately it is yeah yeah just to give like the listeners a lowdown and in (laughs) fairness if you don't follow this that's absolutely fine because it is it's a it's a process so the top team in each of the UEFA groups will go through to the world cup nine runners up from all the groups will compete in a playoff for the final two spots and then a third spot goes to the confederation which is just this other competition that they're running to allow people to still get the idea of competing in a world cup but not actually and still enjoy the atmosphere the playoffs consist of two rounds of single leg ties so the two best playoff winners qualify and the third winner goes off to inter-confederation playoffs in the first round those are the sixth worst qualifiers from the group stages now at the moment Ireland are seventh but there are some teams ahead of us who haven't played I feel like it's doubtful we're going to get into that top three no, we will have to play we will have to play that play first off, leg. Essentially. Yeah. yeah we'll have to do the first one um but it starts the campaign you take that but yeah so it's like a semi and a final to get into another playoff essentially but- basically yeah. yeah and then the top three from that first round go into the second round and then the results from that second round tie there's a again there's only a single leg are combined with what you've done in the group stages and that's why I think people forget that sometimes and that's why the group stage result isn't just important for now and the goal difference it also is important for that tie and then whoever top two from that league table are the ones who go through and then the third person goes to confederation so don't you worry we will be reminding you of this um, yeah i'm glad you took the lead on explaining that because it's yeah you need a stats degree to get your head around it yeah no you really would i was sitting in the office today for i'd say a good Quite half a an hour trying to like diagram it out in my head and work out how it made sense but we won't worry about it too much just yet and just enjoy the absolute stress that is getting through the group yes. and then we can have the absolute absolute stress of getting through the playoffs when we touch wood and then the other playoffs and then possibly more playoffs yes exactly (laughs) so Karen I'm going to ask you the dreaded question and this has to be an honest answer this isn't like uh I'm playing it down because I'm worried about what is going to happen what do you think is a realistic result for this game uh I think we can win it by a single goal if we don't concede, I, th- I think a one nil could be done. Would I be surprised if it was a one all? No, mm. but I think we will beat Slovakia. Um, I think we will get four points from these two games. Um, mm. I'm afraid to say, yeah, we'll go out and smash them. I think it's possible that we could. It's all leading up to that, but I, I'm going to go with a, a one goal win. One mm. nil. Okay, that, that's that's right. very. What are you thinking? I don't know. I'm I'm a bit similar. I feel like it could be like a one nil, but then I also feel like I could see us going out and winning like three one or something. Mm. I mean, we managed two one away from home, especially with the crowd and yeah. the atmosphere is going to be good. And Finland could drop their heads if we potentially take an early lead. Um, but I'm say that so sticking with one now. 
<laughs> and also though we do have the evidence of like say even when they I, I'm not comparing us to Spain I know we're very different oh, we're the exact same as Spain. <laughs> <laughs> hey they have their own problems at the moment that we don't have so they're calling up their president wanting to get rid of Gilda after yeah. giving him a new contract right beside the Euros so at least Katie McCabe isn't ringing up the FBI and being like we need to get Bureau Pow out yeah. days before World Cup qualifiers yeah. um but no I can kind of mm, I'm going to be optimistic and I'm going to go for a 3-1 win to Ireland and I'm hoping you're right. Not, I hope you're right I you know what if it's 1-0 if it's 2-1 if it's 50-0 I actually don't mind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so long as it goes our way that is the thing that matters exactly and yeah I think today's news is a good it's a good boost for the team and I hope they see it as that and I hope they see it as something because I think the players they have brought in are quite inexperienced they're not anyone that we would have seen if you look at the level or I know Finland are ranked higher than us but if you look at the level of where the players are playing we probably have more of the standout players yeah. um well, I'm just hoping Corpella is very busy, that she gets very, very tired. And after her 15 plus years of being number one in Finland makes a horrendous mistake that we can just... <laughs> no, we wouldn't no I, would actually, I would never wish that on a girl. <laughs> What's he uh, doing? <laughs> well, we shall see how we are feeling when we come back to you all after the game. But for now, Karen, thank you very much for that. So the WSL season is not that far off and I'm very excited for it to come back. We The transfer window closes slightly before it on September 8th and then it kicks off on September 10th with Tottenham playing United. Another nice tie that weekend will be Arsenal versus City, kind of giving us last season vibes where we had Arsenal-Chelsea on the first day. But for to start off with, we'll have a proper preview before the tournament actually starts. But we're going to do our top transfers since everyone's in that kind of mood with the Premier League window also closing soon. Um, so we have brought on Emma Carroll. You're not doing your team of the week. We're switching things up a little bit before we get back into those. And you're going to give us your winners and losers for every club in terms of who has had the best transfer window i think we'll go with losers first because that's always kind of fun to <laughs> yeah because that might take a while is it when we're speaking about manchester city <laughs> i'd say um, the biggest loser probably is yeah man city or else everton but um man city have just lost so many players everton have just done what they've done the last few for the seasons. last few seasons in a row where pretty much the whole team is gone or a good chunk of their squad like 10 players out i think it was and eight in so far still time in an international window as well um and then yeah just the mass exodus of manchester city is yeah it's really ominous for them i think going, i can't see them challenging this year at all i mm. think if they win a county cup or something maybe they might be lucky but i don't think they're going to get champions league i think united might pip them mm. putting it out there <laughs> makes oh. me to say <laughs> Very happy. So just <laughs> if anyone hasn't managed to keep track of it over the summer, City have lost uh, Caroline Weir to Real Madrid, Lucy Bronze to Barcelona in what was to me the most surprising transfer of the summer just because like it happened. No one had a clue about it. Everything else had kind of been, you know, hint about Stanway leaving was hint about Weir leaving was hint about. It was kind of talked about Scosh retiring. Everyone kind of thought Ellen White might retire. Bardsley as well we all kind of knew those ones were coming that one to Barcelona was insane and now they're possibly going to lose Kira Walsh as well who was a standout player in the year if Europe. Man City lose Kira Walsh they're not competing no but that's year, like their I whole midfield think. is gone and it yeah, was I mean the people who kind of dragged them back from the trenches last year I thought was Weir at Walsh and kind of Stanway nearly now mm -hmm. Stanway obviously wasn't happy that she was being deployed in different positions and she seems to be loving life over at Bayern now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're big, big losses. And yeah, bronze, you were looking at kind of leadership then. That's another big name gone from them. Mm -hmm. So they brought in some Spanish players, I think, just to... Bush. Yeah, they brought in oh. Leila Alexandri, uh, Leila Uabi. They also have Dana Castellanos. And then Mary Fowler, who is a great talent from Australia, but is still mm -hmm. quite young. And when yeah. you look at the experience base that City have lost... It's a man. And we were saying as well, Janine Becky went earlier in the year, another great player. 
and you mentioned there Stanway she did that interview with Sky Sports where she said about she was frustrated she wasn't playing in the same position she couldn't really put her mark on anything Emma and I were talking about this earlier and saying it's kind of funny because what a lot of people would have said about her is it's great that she's so versatile and that's what makes her dangerous but yeah I think as a player though you want consistency and yeah that's what I was gonna say you feel like you own that position and there's no one better than you in that position you don't want to be just like a makeshift here there and everywhere kind of player you want to make make your stamp on it and and she she did brilliantly in the Euros I thought that I was surprised she got the nod so consistently um but she was fantastic inside with Walsh Mm -hmm. and do you think that say her saying all that and like obviously she seems a lot happier you said Caroline we are knocking Man City out of the (laughs) Champions League Uh, again for the the fifth time in six years that City have been knocked out by Spanish opponents so they're just having a great time over (laughs) in Spain it's just so perfect (laughs) they all seem quite happy with their moves and they all seem quite frustrated and like have all spoken about it since that they were frustrated about the way they were playing or the positions they were playing in do you think maybe it is time for a bit of a culture shift or a bit of a change up in City because everyone would have said like three or four years ago they were the team leading the way when it came to wages when it came to bringing people in and they seem to have stalled a little bit somewhere yeah uh, yeah Garrett Taylor I don't, like is it just because he was in already part of the club that he got the job I know I've seen online a lot of fans are calling for Jane Ludlow to take over as manager and mm. that seems to be the vibe around City that they're just not happy and when you've got all those list of players have that have moved on there's something not quite right mm. you know I think Arsenal have moved themselves closer to be running with Chelsea Manchester City have just dropped off and moved further away you thought they were going to be the ones challenging in the Champions League challenging for titles and it's I don't think it's going to happen mm. this season also worth mentioning that the Walsh transfer is possibly hitting seven figures yeah, it's supposed to be a world record if mm. it goes through so I think that would be is it harder is the world record at the moment I think yeah yeah so yeah that would overtake harder which is pretty impressive but also not really the sort of record city want to be making at this stage (laughs) if I was them I'd be doing everything I could to hold on to her but I think it'll be hard to turn that down um yeah where Barcelona are getting the money now who knows (laughs) well they're an interesting one because I feel like Barcelona have always recruited very smartly they've always only brought in players that they really needed for certain positions where it feels like now they're just chucking a lot of money at the situation and hoping it sticks which I mean the women can do running off the club in general yeah Yeah. you know can would they might buy Walsh but will they be able to register (laughs) who knows the way things they're running over there I think they want that Champions League and they're going to do anything they can to get it yeah I think you're right and even the you look at the ones they've brought in like say Lucy Rons who has a, a lot of experience of winning Champions League so They've been smart in that sense. And Emma, what about your winners? Um, considering that we said United will probably pit uh, Man City to the Champions League, let's go with them. Um, I think May Letizia has been an excellent mm-hmm. signing. I think she was just brilliant for Brighton last last year. Um, she was, I think she probably appeared in the team of the week a few times. She's one of the young players to watch. Um, I think that was a really good signing. And then obviously Nikita Paris, although I kind of look at the Euros that Russo and Tune had and wonder how she's actually going to get in the team. Um, but, you know, it probably is an area that Manchester United is struggle with is that depth. If they get injuries, then, you know, they're still a relatively new club, which was growing. So they do start need to make these signings that will give them that depth. And I think that's what's going to help them ultimately pip, uh, pips. Mm. Well, that is something that Mark Skinner talked about a lot last season yeah. was that they didn't have any depth and say even if you do want Russo and Toon to be bossing anything, if you're playing a lower side and maybe you just want to give them a bit of a rest, Paris isn't a bad option to bring on. And the difference as well with the United taking her on, like she came in before Ada Val did and it was just quite clear that there wasn't really space for her in that squad. And then she had to go off the back of not a lot of time into a Euros where, you know, she wasn't playing the way the others were. So maybe this is a good place for her to actually be a part of a squad and know her position and know the impact she can make. Yeah, I think she'll get a, a wing position for them. I can see her being kind of the right wing position because Tune will play 
in the 10 and Russo will be the target player. So I think it's a great move for her. And likewise, Letizia, she obviously is going to a team now that has ambitions of breaking into that top three and challenging in a few years. And she'll when they are challenging, she'll be hitting her prime as well. So two good moves for the club and for the players themselves, I think. And then Arsenal, it was my next one with Lena Hurtick. Um, what possibly meet him at was possibly maybe the sign of the season for her Arsenal mm. and managing to keep hold of her. Um, yeah, I still one thing with Arsenal, really yeah, the one thing with Arsenal, I wouldn't put them down as winners of the transfer window because I do think that maybe they need one or two in defence if Williamson gets mm. injured or Sousa, and who has picked up a couple of niggly ones as well last season. Mm quite lacking in depth in that area I just want us to sign like Millie Bright or someone of her equivalent like I feel like when we had Louise Quinn we had that but we have missed that we've just missed a big stocky defender who can like muscle people off the ball Mm -hmm. who wins those headers that come in like we're so top heavy we don't have that defense which like obviously I was delighted when we signed her take and keeping Miedema made my soul sing but realistically we did need to back ourselves up a bit more and I don't know if we've achieved and I don't know if we will achieve and that Chelsea yet. did is the thing yeah. I heard um was it Emma was saying today that Buchanan can become the best defender in the world so that's a statement I mean that's pretty that's close to it yeah and you've got Bright and Ericsson in your team as well that says a lot and an influence yeah. Jess Carter as well that they're Chelsea but that's do depth, have the depth there. and that's why you kind of think that Chelsea will be up there again this season that they're definitely the team to beat so um. well we were saying as well like Buchanan probably was the signing of the summer in the sense that they managed to lure her away from Leon going into a squad that already has a pretty good defensive structure and she seemed very very eager to go you're just like how and like Chelsea have made a lot of good signings this year like she's probably the biggest name one and you totally forgot it happened because it was a couple of months ago I think it was before the Euro started but even players like Eve Perise like she was really impressive in their preseason game at the weekend I know they lost players like G but they seem to have backed themselves quite well and I would be concerned I think they're gonna do it again looking at all the teams I don't think they're gonna be yeah. going anywhere no and then, so we've done United, we've done Arsenal, so let's do Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Get used to it. The Liverpool bias is in the coming WSL. out already. <laughs> First um, back of the new season. <laughs> I think um, they've recruited quite well in experience-wise, you know, with bringing back Shanice van der Sanden, Gilly Flaherty as well is a, is a good, like, just solid experience def- WSL mm. defender. Like, it's just what you need in that four season back just to make sure that you're not going straight back down. And I don't think they will because I'm hoping and tipping Liverpool will at least finish above Everton. Um. <laughs> I think they could finish above Leicester as well. Yeah, I'm kind of Possibly going Villa. mid-table-ish maybe. Yeah. They've had a good pre-season as well. Um, and Koi Visto as well has been a, was had a good season last year at Brighton as well. You kind of worry about Brighton. Get but we hope she's not going to have a good day on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Fingers crossed not, no. Um, and then I suppose the other signing, which was an interesting one after the Euros, was Rachel Daly going back to the WSL as well, going back to Aston Villa. And the reason why I kind of have her on the list is because I just want to know where she's going to play. Is she going to play in front <laughs> in her natural position or is she going to wind up at left back somewhere? Uh, maybe hopefully keep playing that position in the hope of keeping that England spot in the World Cup. It's just going to be interesting to see exactly what happens with her, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. I think she should try and keep that full back spot. I mean, she's kind of just hanging on there, I would say. So she needs to be showing that that's her best position. She's not going to do that if she's up top. I was a little bit surprised that she's gone to Villa. I don't think Villa showed a huge amount last season that makes me think that they're going to push on in any way, but she wanted to come home, I guess. And that was the offer that came. don't know if I you mean, I have made a couple of decent signings as mm-hmm. well. Like Kenza Daly as well from Everton, who was probably one of Everton's yeah. standout um, performers last season. Wasted really. at Everton, really. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was a decent signing as well. So it will be interesting to see what actually happens with them. But 
yeah, she probably could have gotten a bigger club, really. But yeah, maybe, as you said, maybe she just wanted to come home, and that was the offer that was on the table. So yeah. you can imagine if the deal had happened like after the Euros, because it was before it, wasn't it, or during it, or was it just after? Just after, just like after. Just after. Yeah. I feel like it's the sort of thing that was like already in motion before yeah. the competition, though, because I remember thinking at the time, oh, if I know she didn't have a great Euros. But I think that was mostly with the position she was playing, but she probably could have gotten a different team. But I think you're probably right. She probably just wanted to come home and that was the offer on the table. Um, and just to finally wrap up and continue our Irish bias, we have to give a special mention, of course, to Diane Caldwell moving from United to Reading and also Jessu to West Ham, which did happen earlier, but it only came into effect over the summer with the way that the transfer window works. So... Jessie in particular, I think we're all going to be very interested to see how she performs. And she was talking about it today, how much she's already learned, including learning how to cook. So congratulations. <laughs> good. That. The game time <laughs> is good. going to be the big thing for Jess. I, I hope she gets enough game time um, because we have seen a lot of our players go over to the top league, not get game time and end up dropping down. So if she can, if she can get in there, it'd be fantastic. I also think that move for Diane is brilliant. I think she'll Reading is a really good fit for her. She'll have a lot of defending to do, but it's in a, a solid team and she can maybe bring a bit more consistency to them, which I think mm-hmm. they need a bit more. They were very up and down last year. Well, Emma, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on the podcast for the rest of the season. Thank you. For our first episode back of the new season, we are very lucky to be joined by former Ireland goalkeeper Marie Horhan and current interim London V's manager. So you've been busy in the time since you announced your retirement, Marie. You haven't stepped back and taken a bit of time to yourself. No, yeah, it's been um, a bit of a whirlwind a few weeks, I'm not going to lie. Um to be fair, I was quite involved last season with them anyway, um, even though obviously I was still um, playing with Birmingham. And then circumstances just presented themselves and um, I was basically offered the role and thought, why not? Got a bit of spare time, so uh, we'll give it a bit of a go. And how did that work last season? So that obviously Birmingham, London. Yeah, what was it's... your week looking like? Yeah, it was pretty hectic. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It was quite full on. Um, so, you know, was based in Birmingham probably three, four days a week. And then whenever I got days off, because obviously London's where I'm from um, and I've, I've got um, an apartment here anyway. So I'd always come back down and obviously family and friends and everything around here. And in fairness, it's not too bad. The commute is only about probably about an hour and a half, just an hour and a half, hour and three quarters. So, um, yeah, there was plenty of uh, motorway travel and sort of uh, podcasts and uh, you know lots of uh, time spent on the phone for the journeys but no it wasn't it's not it's not a unbearable um, commute. And you obviously had your playing career but was coaching something that you always looked to as something you wanted to go into I know I think you're doing your UEFA or had started your UEFA licenses in the last couple of years? Yeah, so I basically since probably the last three years, um, I'd started doing, I'd finished all my B licenses in the last sort of year. Um, <clears throat> I was just finishing off the A licenses. Um, and it was, it sort of got to a stage last season, like I had um, two quite serious hip injuries. I fractured my hip twice. Um, so that kind of you know, obviously from that point onwards, I was a little bit like, right, okay, what's the future going to look like for me? And if I wanted to stay in football, what did it look like? Did I want to go down the coaching managing route or did I want to go more sort of the sports directorship route? And um, to be honest, I say this opportunity sort of came into, came into play sort of out of the blue. Um, And I thought, well, yeah, no, actually quite enjoyed sort of like the coaching that I had done up to that point um, I thought it was a great opportunity now for me to sort of gain experience in a head coach role which you know these roles don't come about very often. And when you started with London Bees it was just as a goalkeeping coach is that right? Yeah and then sort of the beginning of the season it was going to be more of like an assistant coach role um, and then obviously the, the manager left um, she took a full-time role to go to Coventry and the club just said, like, look, we'd be really keen for you to come in and take the, the head coach role. Is it something that you'd want to do? And 
sort of had a bit of time to think about it. And as I say, it was an opportunity that it doesn't come around very often to get a head coach position as well. Um, so it was something that I just thought, yeah, it's, you know, when sometimes you just say it's written in the stars. So I was yeah. like, yeah, well, why, don't we, why don't we go and give it a go? Can't, you know, can't, can't go and do any worse than someone else. So <laughs> let's go and give it a try type thing. But no, I'm really enjoying it up to this point. It's, as you say, it's a very different perspective now um being being a coach rather than a player but I feel like I'm adapting quite well I don't think anyone would be overly surprised I mean in any of the analysis meetings I was in you're very conscientious and have a brilliant football brain but you worked in as an accountant was it before so did you always want to stay in football do you think or has it just been the last few years when you were approaching retirement you were like oh I'm not ready to leave the game and this is what I want to do or do you see yourself going back I mean <laughs> as, as you're well aware Karen it's it's not it's something you've got to have you know something else in in your armory yeah like, rightfully the women's game is going in the right direction now in terms of more money's coming into it and players can actually sort of have a, a fairly decent career from it but even post playing you've still got to have you know another career plan for yourself and Obviously, I was fortunate that, you know, I have the financial background that it is something, again, that I was looking to possibly use sort of still in the sporting sporting mm-hmm. context, if you like, um, through sort of like financial advising and things like that. But um, I couldn't just sit down all day again. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, once you've been active and like, you know, you know yourself, like mm-hmm. it's. It's, it is a different world, sort of, uh, you know, the football bubble we used to say that, that you're living in. And it's very, as you say, it's a challenge then to go back to the day-to-day, nine-to-five. Um, so, but as I say, it's something that it's, it's another string to my bow. So if I, I do want to go back into it, it's an option there for me. But at the moment, as I say, like this opportunity within football has presented itself. And I'm, I'm sort of like quite happy to sort of persist with that and see where it takes me. Yeah. How have you found the, obviously you said that you were going to go into more of an assistant role anyways this year, but how have you found going into that straight head coach role with your main experience being a goalkeeping coach and your main playing experience obviously being a goalkeeper? What sort of influence do you think that has given you as a coach? Or do you think it has influenced the way that you approach things? Because it's rare enough to get former goalkeepers going into those head coach roles. They tend to stay very specified and very much like in their bracket of goalkeeping and even defense coaching in general. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you go into any any club and, you know, the the member of coaching staff that pretty much 90% of the players all like is the goalkeeping coach because they're always the one as seen as the players go to and have a bit of a moan and complain why don't we do this why don't we do that so they're they're seen as the good cock so yeah obviously that would have been the easier option for me to, to go into that route um, but I, I just feel like throughout my career I've been very sort of um, player centred and even like the teams and environments that I've been in I've been very much conscious of you know sort of supporting players helping players so I've almost taken that approach then into management because I think for me the biggest thing especially on in the women's side is being able to have build relationships and rapport with players on an individual basis because I think if you can manage them as individuals then you can bring the group together um, and it solves a lot of problems before they even appear because you're you've got that ability to have a one-to-one conversation with someone and you know like so then the difficult conversations that you know they're they're not don't become as big as they need to be Mm -hmm. because you have that ability to you know confront issues without it you know being a big problem and sort of um you know sort of other players getting involved because as you say like a lot of the time it's because things aren't addressed early on um so just the ability yeah for me that was the the biggest thing that I was really conscious about going into this role is that I'm developing a relationship with everybody within within the the squad um, so that I know them on an individual basis. So then when I do need to talk to them, whether it be, you know, a difficult conversation and whether it be a positive conversation, that there is that relationship already there that it's it's not difficult. Yeah, I think that's really important. Do you and I've noticed that as I've played and kind of watching different relationships, do you think that that's more a female 
thing or do you think it's just kind of like the modern game where you do need to kind of be able to put your arm around footballers shoulders now um do you think I think, more... def- I think definitely within the women's game it's even more important yeah. um it's managing personalities and as you say like everyone is individual in a slightly different way um but I think also generally um, in, in terms of the generation we live in now very much so like the gone are the days of you know the stick and the carrot like it yeah. doesn't work anymore like you need to be able to you know set sit people down and have honest conversations but in a way that you know you can get them still to buy into what you're doing it's not very sort of dogmatic in in what you're saying you've got to be able to sort of you know talk to people in a manner that you know, it may be something difficult that you're having to put to them, but in a way that they walk away from the conversation rather than being defeatist or sort of angry and just, you know, sort of not buying into what you're doing. Um, I think the generation we live in now is, is, that's so important. Yeah. Um, Just the way, it's not, is it, I've always, always, my mantra in life has always been, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And it's so important in, in, in today's era of football, I think. Yeah. And you've had a long career and you've played under a lot of different coaches. Have you learned, picked up things or have you learned what not to do from certain <laughs> coaches? Would that be more accurate? I think it's going to get you to name some names now. <laughs> <laughs> I think, listen, listen, it, you, everything that you experience personally, do you know what I mean? That like you put, you know, you keep that in the back of your mind and go, right, okay, if, if ever I'm in this position, that's just definitely a way that I'm not going to do things. Um, so 100% you're right. Like your own, the only experiences that you've lived, you know, that you've been through, you take with you. Um, I, I don't think it's possible possible not to do that. Um, but listen, I've, I've worked with some fantastic managers and coaches who, you know, not just like you say, as you know, tactically and technically on the pitch have been brilliant, but you know, a lot of coaches as well, like, as I say, in terms of managing people and personalities and, and how to go about, you know, setting a culture as well. Um, I've, I've worked with some fantastic people. So I've yeah, definitely moulded my my outlook on, on what I'd like to be as a coach and as a manager. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, personal experiences of, you know, things that have, you know, that you've enjoyed, but equally that, you know, have taught, taught you lessons you take with you so um I'm sure you're exactly the same Karen you've experienced plenty of things along the way where you're like yeah that maybe that could have been done a little bit differently yeah, that's but, why I'm no. steering clear of management I haven't picked up anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say Karen never saw anything wrong she would never complain or have oh, take yeah. issue with anything a ray of positivity <laughs> absolutely not and t- you know too right and all <laughs> and Marie is there any I know you said there definitely are people, but has there been any one particular person or even one particular piece of advice that you've been given that has maybe molded you a bit more than the others or the one that you would take into your own squads in the future, like the one you're working with now or anyone you might work with in the future and say, this is the one thing I can tell you that has stuck with me and I think it could be helpful to you? Um, I mean, I would say one of the biggest things that I took I think it was quite early on in my career it was um when I was at Chelsea and like Emma Hayes had just come in at the club then and she was very clear in terms of like what her vision was and where where she wanted to to take the club and so she was very much like listen I have my expectations and if people fall short of my expectations I'm not going to lower them um I think again something for me that you know it, it, of course it is difficult because people are always going to fall short of your expectations and you know but it's still having that ability to be like right well if if they're not delivering then I've got to do something about it whether that be through recruitment or whether that be through you know more work with people on an individual basis to be able to for them to meet your expectations that for me was a big thing to see obviously because that was quite early on when the WSL sort of came into fruition and she came in and from where she obviously inherited Chelsea to where she's took it now, she's mm. she's stuck to that philosophy. If people haven't done the job for her, you've seen in terms of the players and the personnel that she's brought in, mm. as she says, if you don't get on the bus, the bus isn't going to wait for you, um, which, you know, is a good analogy for anything, really. 
Mm. Or if you've watched the Days and documentary on the inside Chelsea, you know, we see the very polished Emma Hayes, who is, you know, sometimes you get her emotional if it's after a game and she's particularly happy that they've won. But you very rarely see that angry side of her. And watching the documentary, I was like, oh, that's a that's a woman who knows how to get her point across when she's not happy. Oh, no, totally. And as you say, she wouldn't get have got the success that she's had if she didn't have that that dark side if you like if you know to be, um to get to where she is today like you you know you can't be nice if you want to succeed you do have to have that sort of uh side of you where you know if people don't don't meet what you require then you've got to be ruthless with it mm. and has there been an element of head coaching that has surprised you or that you didn't expect to be so you had a bit of experience but I suppose head coaching is entirely different to p- coaching one particular position oh, you know you're as you say you're you're dealing with 20 individuals now um so it, it, it is in terms of the workload obviously you know when you're a player and you watch watching coaches and managers you're like oh well really like you put a training session on and you know then you're done sort of thing what else do you really do like the rest of the day but <laughs> trust me when you're sitting here and you're like literally the phone never stops you know you've got other members of your coaching staff you've got players you've got you know members like the general manager or you know from the directorship of the club bringing you like it's it is relentless so I do appreciate now from you know sitting in my privileged position when you finish training at 2 30 and it's like yeah I'm off now uh, what should I do for the rest of the day which coffee shop are we going to um <laughs> whereas now it's like yeah no your, your work doesn't stop and as I say it's it, it is obviously a challenge but as I say at, at this present moment in time I'm I'm really enjoying it so you know ask me in three months time it might be <laughs> I might be a little bit more tired and irritable but, <laughs> Great um, hairs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what what is the aim for you like I know you said that coaching was something that maybe has only come to the forefront of your mind in the last few years but would you like to progress to say the WSL or at the moment are you just focused on the the current experience like learning what you can and whatever may happen happens Oh, I think so. I mean, listen, you can't you can't sit here and say, all right, in two years' time, I want to be doing this, this and this. Life don't work like that. We we all know that. Um, and for me as well, like I'm in the infancy of my coaching career. So there's going to be a lot of mistakes that I make now. Um, so I need that time to obviously establish myself and, you know, grow as a coach because it would be really foolish for me to go, yeah, I'm, I want to be, you know, a top division manager within the next x amount of years because as i say like you, you football's unpredictable you know you can't go and make these grand sort of claims that you're going to do this and that because as you say it's a results driven business first and foremost um so you're not in a position to to predict what you know where you're going to be in six months time never mind in three years um so for me like i say the where i'm at at the moment is is perfect for me in terms of as you say I, i'm i'm learning I'm developing on a daily basis. I'm doing things that are pushing me out of my comfort zone. Um, so for me at the moment, this is the environment where it's it's really, you know, enabling me to to develop and obviously, you know, ultimately grow as a coach. And where that leads to, who knows? You know, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm an ambitious person and I'd love to manage at the top level, but I'm not foolish enough to sit here and say, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that because listen, too many people have done that and, you know, have gone literally, you've not heard of them ever again. So for me, for the now, is just literally to focus on where I'm at and try and, you know, grow, be su- successful for London Bees this season and, and see where that takes us. Do you promise if you become the next Emma Hayes, you'll still come back and talk to us? <laughs> oh, of course. Of course. I'll give you all the horror stories and all the, go- all the, all the, all the, uh, the gossip along the way. <laughs> Might we start to see a few Irish girls in London bees colours? <laughs> <laughs> listen, my, my my contacts in my phone has been <laughs> I've rinsed them. So listen, any any little uh, any little bit of uh, support that I can get, you know full well I'll be uh, cashing in on that. So listen, if there's any 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 players that are interested, you know what I mean, <laughs> like 
you know you know where I am yeah I mean it's been a pretty epic summer of football especially for women's football with the Euros and we've heard so much I mean I was over in England I covered the whole Euros I saw the impact it had I saw friends of mine who'd never watched women's football be like oh Kathleen can we go to the pub and watch the match tonight like England are playing its class and it was all great from that side but from your side and being in a coaching setup and being at a club have you felt any of that bounce yet or do you think it's going to be a bit more of a long drawn out thing? (laughs) Oh no, definitely. I mean, even at the level that that, that our teams are in, every team in the league has, has seen at least a three hundred percent increase on their season tickets. Mm. And I mean, some clubs literally were like on the first day they've sold more than they did last season. Mm. So you've immediately seen seen the bounce. It's just a case now sustaining that interest. Um, obviously, with the WSL, like the championship started last weekend, the WSL starts in a couple of weeks so you know it's going to be visible again you know with the games being back on sky but it's important it's still so important that you know that sort of uh, the visibility is maintained and you know like it's it's great that obviously some of the games in the WSL are being put in the main stadium but that needs to be sustained throughout the whole season it can't just be like you say at you know marquee weekends and marquee games like it needs to continue because as you say you saw with you know, the attendance is not just at the final, but throughout the tournament, like the appetite is definitely there. Um, mm. And it's just a case now of, you know, publicising it and doing as much as you can, much as we can on the on the media side of things to really continue to push it. Because, you know, a lot has been said in terms of like the scheduling and fixtures and the times of games and stuff. But it's so important that they get that right. Mm. Because, you know, if you've got games that, you know, 11.30 on a Saturday morning, you know, for a fact that your main sort of target audience is families and young girls, you know, they're realistically, either they're going to be, you know, playing games or they, you know, they're not going to be able to get to games. So this is where the league's got to be clever um, and the organisers have to be clever now to, to, to keep sustaining that interest because, as I said, the appetite is there and people do want to come and watch the game. So, you know, it's sort of over to the FA a little bit more, but, you know, obviously living in London as well, just seeing, as I say, I went down to Wembley for the final and it was just, as you say, you saw like grown men with, you know, mead on the back of their England shirts. Like, it yeah. is amazing. And it was like, I know, and Karen will say the same from like our era to see that. We never in a million years thought we'd see that. Um, so, to, so the game to be in the position that it is now, you know, it's you've, literally we've got to try as much as we can to keep it there. Yeah. I mean, we never had more than one stand open for our international games and now Tala is sold out and that's even the bounce that's happening over here. So it's going to be huge in England and hopefully we can kind of piggyback off that. But like you say, it is up to the federations to to push it and grow it. And um, the FA have a, a really good marketable product now. Um, the FAI have a bit to go, obviously, with the Women's National League here, but they're starting with the international games, but it has to filter down as well. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> oh, I'm missing 100%. And ultimately, for me, you know, you want eventually to get the women's team in the Aviva. Yeah. You know, that's what that's what we want. I and mean, it's fantastic, obviously, that the Tala sold out. But, you know, equally, you're going, well, potentially, could you have sold 20,000 tickets for, that, for this Finland game? Mm. And that's where that's where you know the association have to look now and be like, right, well, we've got it to this level, but we need to continue to push it. What's next? Yeah. Mm. You get England over here for a friendly. You work all your English contacts, and we'll work all our Irish ones. We'll have a massive one party in the Aviva with the two sides. It'd be quite good. Uh, listen, it's the undoubtedly like we we know, you know. The national team, they will fully support the national team. Mm. If you put it on, the people will come. And that's that's my message is literally we'll give it give the girls the opportunity. Yeah. Well, Marie, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck with the rest of the season. We will be following along closely and undoubtedly coming back to you to see how you are going in a couple of months' time. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's it's been it's been great to talk to you. Anyway, thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, well, that's it for us for today's Koi Gig podcast. We will be back with you next week on Wednesday this time as we will be reacting to the Slovakia game. And we will also have a bumper WSL preview. Also, you should definitely tune in next week because we have some very exciting prizes to give out thanks to our sponsors at Cabri. Um, we had our Vicker Street Roadshow recently, which if you haven't checked it out, there are some clips on YouTube and on social media and they're well worth a watch. Well worth going along to the those things so there's a lot of good stories told on the night as well that don't make it to um any sort of publication but we're looking to support irish women's grassroots football as we've just said it's very important so over the next few weeks we will be giving you an opportunity to win equipment for your local club terms and conditions will apply and we will give you some more details on that next week thank you to emma and marie for joining us and of course to you too karen as always i look forward to stressfully texting you on thursday <laughs> If you have any thoughts ahead of the game or just want to enjoy it alongside us or let us know how you feel, if it's delighted, if it's devastated, we're hoping that last one won't apply. Please do get your thoughts into us on email at the Koi Gig Pod at offtheball.com. See you all next week. The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support.